praise God. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. Do you want to hear the Word of God this morning? Yeah? All right. Well, let's uh, open up our Bibles. Exodus chapter 4. Powerful anointing here today. Wow. Powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 5. When you have it, you can say amen or you can look up at the screen. Genesis, Exodus. Second book of the Bible, chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 5. It says the following, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor will they hearken to my voice. For they shall say, The Lord has not appeared unto you. And the Lord said to Moses, What is in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he he said, Cast the rod on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and the rod became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. And the Lord said to Moses, Put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared unto you. Can you say amen to the Word of God this morning? The title of the message this morning is, What is in your hand? What is in your hand? Last week we spoke about hands. We spoke about the anointing of our hands. We spoke how how God wants to anoint our hands to uh, be a channel of transferring and imparting spiritual blessings on people. Amen. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. God wants to use our hands to impart spiritual blessings. God wants to use our hands to bless, to bless people, to bless what He's put in our hands, what He's given to us, to bless. He wants to use our hands to to be used in service, that we serve with our hands. Uh, Joseph, it says, and whatever he did prospered. Amen. And then we spoke about how God wants to use our hands for business, for finances, and for giving and receiving. God wants to use our hands for business, for finances, for giving, giving and receiving. You, can, you have to use your hands to give. Every time you give someone something, whether it's money or a gift, you have to use your hands and you have to open it. So God wants to use our hands to be givers. But not only that, we have to open our hands to, to receive. So how many believe that you can be a giver and a receiver? Come on, church. That God wants to take you to a place that these hands will, will be giving hands and they will be receiving hands. These hands will receive finances for the cause of the kingdom. These hands will be anointed for business. Business, whatever God is called you to do, whatever job you are involved with, whatever it is that God's put in your hands, your hands are anointed to prosper. Can you say amen this morning? And you you need to believe that. if, If you don't believe it, you don't receive it. You can only attain the revelation that you have. You have to believe it. Uh, the, The message that you are critical of is the message you have no part in. The message you criticize is the message you cannot attain. It's a cutoff. We cut ourselves off from what God wants to do in our life when we reject a message. God wants to bless your hands. God wants to anoint your hands for business, for finances. And I I love this, for giving and receiving. Amen? How many want to give? How many want to be a giver? Giver. And how many want to receive? I know that... Uh, Everyone wants to receive, receive. I want to receive. But God's getting ready to release an anointing on His people of giving, of giving. Because when you give, you receive. That's just how it is. And when you understand that, then you just, you look for opportunities to give. When God blesses you, how can I now give? How can I sow? And as I give, I shall receive. Amen. So today, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What has God given to you? What is under your possession? All of us possess something. 
everyone has a possession of something that God has given to us that He wants to use to be a blessing to others. Amen? Look at your hands again. Take your two hands and say, God has given me something. God has given me something. And what He has given to me, He has given it to me so that I can use it to be a blessing to others. Our hands are vehicles. Our hands are channels that God uses to minister through them. Amen. He uses our hands to minister through them. So in the chapter that we just read, God asks Moses the question, what is in your hand? And Moses probably thinks, what's that got to do with what you're asking me to do? You're asking me to deliver the people of Israel out of bondage and bring them and lead them into the promised land. And I'm giving you excuse after excuse as to why I cannot do it. I'm not the man for the hour. As a matter of fact, he's telling God, I cannot even talk right. I stutter when I talk. And it's like God doesn't know that. It's like he's trying to tell God something he does not know. He's trying to convince God, use someone else. I can't do it. And so then God sort of catches him by surprise and asks them this question, what's in your hand? What's that got to do with it, God? And he says to God, what's in my hand is a rod. Everybody say rod. What's in my hand is a rod. Listen, get this revelation that God's taught me this week. He, he, says, he says, God, what's in my hand is this simple, insignificant Rod. It's, it's a rod that, is, that I use, that I made out of, out of wood. It's a stick that was selected with great care by Moses. It's, it, it's been shaped. It's been smoothed. It's been cut so that I can use it. Moses, listen to this. Moses would have used this rod for about 40 years. For 40 years, this rod is in his hand as he's walking in the backside of the desert and he would have used this rod faithfully for self-purpose. He would have used this, this equipment for self-purpose for 40 years faithfully and it would have been used for survival, for protection. It was used for his job, for his business. He was a shepherd. His job was to take care of sheep. So this rod was used as an instrument for his, for his business, for his job, which was to take care of sheep. If you want to read a little bit more about how they used the rod, it's, 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 it's an amazing uh, concept or uh, tool for taking care of sheep. They would, they would use it to, if a sheep was going astray, they would, at the end of the rod was a hook. They would bring the sheep back in. They would use the, sheep, the, the rod to, to hit the one that's being unruly. Yeah. They would use the rod to, to uh, come against the predators. Amen. It was used, the rod was used to help Moses walk and to climb mountains. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a significant tool for Moses. But what I want you to see is this. When God says, what's in your hand? This rod, up until now in the hands of Moses, has been, has been a faithful tool, but it's, it has just been used for everyday work. It's just been used simply for everyday mundane work. But now this rod is going to be used for something extraordinary. This insignificant rod, this, this rod that's been for his self-use, faithful, sharpened, shaped, smoothed, used for his daily, daily actions, daily activities. Now, this simple rod in his hand, because God is going to anoint it, is going to be used to do something extraordinary. The rod... The simple rod became a sign. You read it there later on. God says, this rod will be a sign. 
All of a sudden, it's a sign now. After 40 years of just being something simple in his hand, now this rod in his hand under the anointing of God will become a sign. The, The rod would be used for supernatural acts. If you read the book of Exodus after chapter 4, you will see that how it was used to deliver the people of Israel from over 400 years of slavery. It was used to open the Red Sea. When God says, stretch out your hand, stretch out the rod over the sea, and the sea opened. It was, this, it was, used, it was used to bring water out of the rock. God says, you hit the rock with the rod. And supernaturally, miraculously, this rod that for 40 years was simple, just doing everyday mundane things in the hand of a, of a desert man, now it's doing supernatural things. This rod was used for so much. Something, there was a shift. Moses never expected that this rod in his hand that he saw every day, amen, that he had in his possession, he never in his wildest dreams thought that this, this, this rod would do anything of significance and anything great. The very thing that was simple, the very thing that was natural, the very thing that he did faithfully in a mundane sort of repetitive way, that very thing will now do great exploits, extraordinary things in the hands of Moses because there was a shift. Come on, everyone say there's a shift coming. Hallelujah. Come on, say there's a shift coming. What has been in my hands and I've been faithful with it and I've been using it and I've been preparing it and and, and really nothing significant and nothing extraordinary has happened. That very thing now is going to be touched by God. Your hands will be anointed and that very tool in your hands will now do extraordinary things for the glory of God. Can you say amen, church? Come on, give the Lord a big clap offering there. With your hand. The, the very thing that you say, wow, with the very thing you said, this is just all it does. Hallelujah. It's going to become extraordinary. There's a shift taking place. Hallelujah. I believe there's a shift taking place. I believe God's getting ready to anoint our hands. And what has been ordinary in our hands for years will become extraordinary in a moment's time. What we have been using faithfully, and, and some of you even, even grudgingly doing this thing, working this business, working these children, doing this job, and you think, my, it's just, is this all I'm going to do? Is this, is, it, there's nothing exciting about this. And you've been doing it and you've been working it. Something's getting ready to change. Hallelujah. There's a shift. What's in your hand? You go, a rod. God says, I'm going to use that. But God, for 40 years, I've been just using this to walk around. It's just a simple rod. That's what I'm going to use. What's in your hand? Everyone possesses something. You go, all I have is, all I have is, is, is a marriage. What's in your hand? You have a marriage. What's in your hands, children? These children, they're in your hands. And sometimes you go, ah, oh, these children, my, oh, they're in your hands. Oh, your children in your hands, God's going to do great things through them. God's going to do great exploits through your children. God's going to do extraordinary things through your children. I prophesy that this morning, that the children that have been in your hands, simple, uh, just, just mundane, and, 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 and you have to, to discipline them, and you having to, to, to direct them, and you're feeding them. When they were babies, you had to clean them. Those children, God is going to do great things through them. What is in your hands? A ministry. God's given you a ministry. It's in your hands. 
What's in your hands? God's given you a church. What's in your hands? Finances, finances. You said, this, I've got no money. God said, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. God say, I'm going to use your ministry. God's, what's in your hands? I've got a business. I've got a business. And you have a great dream. You have great vision. You have a great potential. And God says, I'm going to use the business. I'm going to use what's in your hands. And you say, God, nothing good has come out of this up until now. God says it's getting ready to change. What's in your hands? Your career your employment position, your gifts and your talents. You have gifts, you have talents that God has given to you. That's in your hands. God has placed that in your hands. And you say this gift, this talent will never be used. And God says, I'm going to use it from this day forward. Hallelujah. Number one, what do we do with what's in our hands? Number one. Number one. If we want God to use what's in our hands for great things, number one, don't despise what God has placed in your hands. Number one, don't despise what God has placed in your hands. The first thing we look at is we look at the the dream, the vision, the great thing that we want to do, the the need that is before us, and we look at what's in our hands and we say, this this is never do it. It is never going to accomplish it. Then I can just see Moses saying, a rod. Don't despise what God has placed in your hands. Jesus was confronted by at least 20,000 people that needed food. And there was a little boy, little lad who had five loaves and two fish in his hands. And one of the disciples of Jesus says to Jesus, Philip was his name. He says, Jesus, there's a little boy here who has five loaves and two fish. And then he says this, but what is that among so many? And in other words, what is that going to do to feed 20,000 people? That won't even feed a family of six. But look at Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't despise what is, what is placed in his hands. He says, give me the five loaves and give me the two fish. Because in my hands... They will be anointed. In my hands, they will multiply. In my hands, they will become something extraordinary. And five loaves and two fish fed 20,000 people and there was leftovers. Don't despise what God has placed in your hands. Don't despise your ministry. Don't despise your marriage. Don't despise your children. Don't despise the finances that you have up until now. Don't despise your business. Don't despise your career choice. Don't despise the employment position that you have. God is getting ready to do something. Don't despise your gift and your talent. You know, we're so quick to look at, at what we don't have, at, at what we wish we did have, not understanding that what we have is enough in the hands of God. Oh, I wish I had that gift. I wish I had this much money. I wish I had that kind of a ministry. I, I, I just wish I had that employment position. I, 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 just, I wish I had those looks or that, that family name. And, you know, and, I, and I just see God saying, I just wish you knew who I am. And that all I need is for you to believe that what you have in your hand is enough for me to do great things with it. Come on, church. Don't despise what you have in your hands. Don't despise your gift and your talent. Don't despise your praise and your worship. Don't despise. Don't let anyone say, oh, you. What is that among so many? You, you, you had that dream. You have that vision. And look what you have right now. Don't despise it. David wants to take out Goliath and his brothers say, get away, you little shepherd, shepherd boy, trying to despise him. But he knew in whom he had believed. He knew the God that he served. Come on. Can the church say amen this morning? In 1 Kings chapter 17, we're not, don't go there, verse 7 to 16, there's a widow woman who has a great need. And she... she she says to the prophet Elijah, when he says to her, give me some food. And she says, 
She says in, in verse 12, as surely as God lives, I don't have any bread. Now listen to this. I don't have any bread, only a hand full of flour. A little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home. Make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She's in a bad place, isn't she? Elijah says to her, look, if you give to me first of that little portion, God is going to do something extraordinary. And if you, if you read that, it says that the, the whole time that there was famine in the land, she had flour, she had oil, and the Bible says that, that all of her family and all of her connections, her circle of friends, never lacked flour and oil. God multiplied the handful of flour. She, dis- she, she despised it. She said, I've only got a handful of flour. God says, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. And, and, and this is a, see, this is a, a testament that, that God can take small things and turn them into big things. From little things, big things grow. Amen. Don't despise what God's given to you. I mean... I don't think anyone this morning is in the predicament of this woman. I've got a little handful of flour. I've got a little oil. Notice these words, little, little. Yeah. And then she says, I've got a few sticks. She's even counting the sticks. Yeah. Not even the sticks want to come her way. Yeah. She's bad, in a bad place. Not even the sticks want to get involved with her. Yeah. I've got a few sticks. Two I've got a little flour, I've got a little oil, and I've got two sticks that have said yes. And I'm going to go and eat, and I'm going to die. And Elijah says, enough for God. That's enough for God. Give him the flour. Give him the oil. Give him the bread. And you watch what God does. Don't despise the little flour you have right now. Don't despise the little that you have right now because God can do great things from it. Amen, church. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Do not despise the days of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plum in Zerubbabel's hand. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise the day of small starts, small beginnings. Don't despise your little ideas. Don't despise your small ideas. Don't despise the small dreams. Don't despise the insignificant job you think you have. Because it's that job that God will use as a platform for the next level that He has for you. Don't despise the, the, the position that you have that is, seems insignificant, that seems like no one, nobody notices. Don't despise the little gift, the little talent that you have. Don't look down upon the small opportunities that come your way. Don't despise the prayer time you have with God. Don't despise your study of His Word. Don't despise and look down upon your relationship with God. It might be small. It might be insignificant. Maybe nobody nobody takes notice, but God does. And God can take that small. Oh, and he can do such greatness. I don't know if you're getting this church this morning, but I'm speaking prophetically. I know that God is getting ready to do great exploits in the life of his people that are willing to believe that even though I might have something small in my hands right now, I'm willing to give it to him and believe 
that he can bring something great out of it. Amen. Don't say it's a waste of time. Don't say it's a waste of my energy. It's a waste of my resources. Don't despise what God has given to you. Can you say amen, church? What do you have in your hand, Moses? A rod. And what's that got to do with the vision? What's that got to do with the the mission you're giving to me to deliver the people of Israel? What's that got to do with me having to go and approach Pharaoh? That's what's going to be the sign. That very thing in your world that's been quiet for 10 years, but you've been doing it. You've been working it. You've been using it in obscurity. You've been using it in the desert. That very thing is getting ready to come out into the open. And God's going to do great things with it. Don't despise. Don't despise what God has put in your hands. Number two, be faithful and fruitful with what is in your hand. Be faithful with the whatever God has placed in your hands. When Philip in Acts chapter 6 was asked to serve tables, he was faithful and he did it well. He did what he did with his hands faithfully and God in turn gave him more. If you read Acts chapter 6, the, the, the apostles are choosing, they're going to choose seven disciples, seven deacons, sorry, deacons, deacons to serve tables. And one of them was Philip. And if you read the life of Philip in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 21, he, on his heart, was burning to be an evangelist. On his heart was a vision to preach the gospel to the nations. On his heart was a passion for seeing bodies being healed and demon-possessed people being set free. On his heart was itinerant preaching, going from city to city, nation to nation to preach the gospel. But in Acts chapter 6, when he has, when he has an opportunity to be given a, a position, they give him the deacon position to serve tables with his hands. Be faithful. Be faithful with what God has placed in your hands now because it's a test. Everybody say, it's a faithfulness test. It's, a, it's, it's, it's faithfulness is the test that God gives to us. God doesn't give us a performance test or a gift test. He doesn't give us a test of charisma. He gives us a faithfulness test. How do we treat what He's put in our hands? will determine whether we get more of it. What you don't value, you have no access to have more. He began to serve tables with His hands and He did it well. He was faithful and He was fruitful. The word faithfulness in the Bible is actually fruitfulness. What we think of faithful is most times just management. God does not want us to manage what He's put in our hands. He wants us to be fruitful with it. He wants us to multiply it, to grow it. Someone says to a husband and a wife that have been married for 40 years, my, they've been faithful to one another. But it could be they just put up with each other. They don't say amen. Maybe they put up with each other. That's not faithfulness. See, there are many that are just putting up with what God's put in their hands. Oh, I have to do it because I'm a husband. Fruitful. Multiply. Increase. Attitude. Motivation. Amen. Enthusiasm. God is not blind and He's not deaf. Someone that wants to be a 
preach it to the nations. And then when they're given the position of a welcome team crew and they go, I have to go and greet people. And, and if only the pastor knew that I'm a preacher, that I'm, a, I'm an anointed. And God's listening to that. And if we're not being faithful with what he's put in our hands, God we're not, is not obligated to give us more. Be fruitful with it. Multiply it. Increase it. Do it with a good attitude. Because God is watching. It's a faithfulness test. It might not be what I want to do, but I'm going to do it well anyway. It might not be where I want to be, but I'm going to do this well anyway because I know that I will not, not always be here. I know that I will not always have this much. God will bless me. God will prosper me. God will increase me and He multiply me as I do things faithfully and with fruitfulness. Hallelujah. Attitude, church. Attitude. Someone has one child, two children. Now nah, these children are. And you know, Father, I want another son, another daughter. Saying, you're complaining about the two you have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, God, I want more. I want more, God. I want more. And God says, but what you had, you're not doing well. Yeah. You're being unfaithful with what I've given to you. I, you have a business. God, give me more clients. Give me more clients. And the clients that you get, you treat them bad. Amen. Amen. I have to, you know, with my, those of you who know that Eric and myself, have a, we have a, a business that God has blessed us with, and, and I sometimes have to control myself because I want to get all apostolic with the clients. And I've got to remember, okay, now this is not church, this is not ministry, this is business. Customer service. <laughs> not customer chasing away. <laughs> customer service. Amen. Got to do it well. It's, it's so, it is such a training to develop a good attitude and to do things well when you don't feel like it. Because God has put this in my hands. I'll tell you, if I've got to put the chairs out, mm, I've got the measuring tape, and those of you that know me, they think it's a little bit AD, you know, a bit, a bit, a bit of the, the, what's that called? That, that got a problem, you know, but OCD, you know, but they, I just, it, it, it'll bother me. If I'm, I'm, that, that is a little bit too, the, too much to the left right now. That's going to come back with this way. Too much, but a perfectionist. For God. It's for God. He deserves the best. And he's watching. And he knows what's on your heart. He knows what you're crying out for. He knows your vision and your dreams. But he's saying, I'm going to take you there, but do this well. I'm going to take you there. I'm gonna, that's, for, that's easy for me. I can do that in one day. But you, it takes me a long time. <laughs> so let the process begin. Oh, I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit here. And I have to do part two next Sunday because this is, I'm still in number two and I've got four, four, four thoughts that I want to share with you. But we have to be faithful with what's in our hands. Fruitful. Grow it. Increase it. Multiply it. When the time came in Acts chapter 8 and the church was scattered because persecution came, they needed to send someone to Samaria. And the apostles gathered around and they said, we need to send someone to Samaria to preach over there, to start a church. And they started talking. Who should we send? Who do you think, Peter? And Peter starts mentioning some names. And then the other, the other you know, Luke and John's, no, 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 I don't know about him. I just, I've observed him and, you know, bad attitude sometimes, you know, not, not right conduct. You know, instead of praying for people, he's beating them. And, you know, in, instead of helping people, he's hurting them. And it, it, he has his good days and his bad days. And then, what about this other? Yeah, yeah. What? 
and someone said, there's a, there's, a, there's a guy by the name of Philip. And, and we've been observing him, and he, he's serving tables. He's got a smile on his face. He's singing while he's doing it. He's, he's just, he has enthusiasm. And then not only that, but when he's doing it, he's looking for opportunities to share the gospel. He's, he's praying with people. The other day we saw him lay hands on the sick and they recovered while he was on his job. And they is it what why don't we send Philip? I think Philip is ready. I think Philip is ready. He's he's done well. He's been faithful. I said, okay, bring him. Let's anoint him. Let's pray for him and let's send him. And he went to Samaria. And now Philip is no longer serving tables. Now he's preaching the gospel. Promotion. But he did, you know, if you read Acts chapter 21. I think it's verse, verse uh, eight. Let me, let me read it because you'll, you'll, you'll hear it. You'll hear it. Acts chapter 21. Look at this. Verse 8, yeah. It says, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed, and we came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. The first time that Philip is called an evangelist is there. In Acts chapter 6, he's just Philip the deacon. When he's anointed to go to to Samaria, he's just Philip the brother. They didn't say evangelist. We're so caught up on titles today. God is looking for people that will do it without the title. Come on. I'm an evangelist now. I've got to preach. I'm a pastor now. I need to talk to people. God's looking for people to do it before you get the title. So when the title is given to us, it's given to us when we're ready. Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9. Look how many chapters between Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 8, he's preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, he's sent to the desert for the Ethiopian. And he's still Philip. Yeah. He's doing it well. With what, what's in his hand, he's doing it well, church. Yeah. We've got to have an anointing where we do things well. Yeah. And I know we're not going to always be with a huge smile on our face. You know, I'm, I'm sure every mother here, when you're cooking, then you're not always with a huge smile on your face. I'm cooking this for these beautiful children that are coming home from school. And I understand, you know, that we have some days where things are not easy. Not, but I'm talking about an attitude. I'm talking about a heart thing. Yeah. Amen. He's, he's sent to Samaria. He's sent to the Ethiopian. And he does it well. See, God, God you don't think God did that on purpose? Mm. Philip, there's a huge revival in, in, in Samaria. Your ministry is growing. I'm going to take you out of there and I'm going to send you to the desert for one person. But God, this thing's thriving. This thing's flourishing. And God's testing. He's just still testing him. Still checking his heart. Will you go for the one? Or will you want to stay in the limelight? Will you go for the one hurting? And he went. He went. So God says, oh, you, you're going to go places. And I, and I think if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, he took the gospel to India. I think it was Philip. It could have been James, but it's one of those two. Expanded. But just here is the first time. Philip the evangelist, but listen to this, who was one of the seven, abode with him. And we abode with him. It says... We entered into the house of Philip the evangelist who was once part of the seven. Which seven? Why does the Holy Spirit take the time to tell us where he came from? It's saying this. He wasn't always an evangelist. He was once part of the seven. What's he saying? He was once a deacon serving tables. 
And he did it well. He did it faithfully. He was fruitful. He increased it. He multiplied it. He did it with a good heart. He's now an evangelist, but he wasn't always an evangelist. He was once part of the seven. Do we have that story where we served faithfully when no one was looking? See, we want to start at the top without ever starting at the bottom. We want visible platform ministry without ever having a behind-the-scenes ministry where we were faithful. We were faithful. There was once a, a, a couple, long time ago, in this, in this church, and we, did, we had a, a roster for cleaning. We had a cleaning roster. And we gave ev- every couple that was in that, part, in that team a weekend that they had to clean the church. And all of them were in ministry. But, they, but the church needed to be cleaned. And someone says, oh, let's, let's hire a cleaner. Let's pay someone. No, I think we can. We can clean the church. So we gave a roster to, and, and, and there was a couple that was not doing it well. Was not doing it well. And then it came, I think this, this couple ended up leaving the church because they, the, they moved. And, I, and, and they said, we're not going to be cleaning anymore, the church. Sort of like with a bit of a smile on their face, like, oh, thank God we don't have to do that cleaning anymore. And I said, from my spirit, I, it came out of me. Now when I think about it, I thought, wow, it was a powerful teaching. I said, I said, that's okay. I said, you had your opportunity to show your faithfulness to God in doing something that is not visibly exciting, but it's something that is important to God. And he he was observing. And I remember the person going, oh. Like looked at me like, oh, wow, okay. It was more than just cleaning toilets and, and vacuuming the church. It was an opportunity to show God how faithful I am cleaning the church building. Amen. There's an anointing on our hands, church. Do it well. The Bible says, He who is faithful in the little will be faithful in the much. He who is faithful, fruitful in the little, God knows this boy, this girl will be faithful with the much. God knows this person will not leave me when they have much. This person will not become selfish when they have much. This person will not become prideful when they have much. This person will not think they're the big shots when they have much. They're faithful. They're faithful with the little. If you don't go through the little season. If you don't go through the season where you have to be faithful with a little idea, with a little strategy, with a little business, with a little bit of ministry, God is not obligated to open the doors for the big arenas. What an opportunity. The season you're in right now, what an opportunity to show God. You put this in my hands, God, this little flower, this rod, Okay, God, I'm going to be faithful with it. And this very thing is going to do extraordinary things for the glory of God. He who is faithful in the little shall be faithful with him. Oh God, if you give me a million dollars, I will serve you. I will give to you. I will, I will, I will pay my tithe. God, just give me a million. God say, no, no. I've just observed you with the $100. How you act with $100. How faithful, how fruitful are you with the money God puts in your hands now? Why would God give us more of that which we squander? Why would God give more to us of that which we eat ourselves? May God help us this morning, church. He who is fruitful with what is in his hands shall get more of it. 
Don't miss out on the chance to be faithful. Did you hear that? That's something powerful for someone today. Get that into your spirit right now. Don't be, don't be, don't miss out on your chance to be faithful with what God has put in your hands right now. It might not be what you want. It might not be what you're dreaming. It might not be what you, where you know God's taken you, but it's an opportunity to be faithful and fruitful. Because listen, and I'm going to continue preaching on this next Sunday. You, you want to be here. You want to... Because that, it, this is the other things that I'm going to share is so powerful. But you listen, that that rod, that rod up until that moment was just a simple rod. But something shifted. And that rod now is going to go from the backside of the desert to the palace of Pharaoh. And, the, and I'm going to share this next Sunday. But that rod, which was, which was in obscurity and in a, in a private setting, was now going to be launched out into a public setting before the whole world of that day. And it was going to show. It became a serpent. It was used to strike the, the Jordan River, to strike the Nile River, to become blood. It was used when Moses grabbed it and he was raising his arms on the mountain and, and uh, Aaron and Hur grabbed his arms because he became tired. He had that rod in his hands. But for 40 years, there it is in the desert. No one even knew who it was, what it was. See, that very thing that you're being faithful with right now that you think, come on, God. That very thing that you, 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 you should not despise. It's that very thing. It's that very thing. It's not going to be another thing. It's that very thing that's going to be extraordinary. That very thing. That very thing. That very marriage, those very children, that very church, that very ministry, that, that very church, that very finances, that business, that job that you have, that job, God's going to use it. Be faithful. Be faithful. God is looking for faithful people that will do well with what is in their hands. Next week, we're going to look at the other two. And it's going to be good. What's in your hands this morning? What's under your possession? What are you doing right now? What's your job? What's your calling? What's your mission? Don't despise it. Give it to you. Amen. And be faithful with it. Do it well. And you watch what God does, which He has placed in your hands. Let's all stand up this morning. Hallelujah.